This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. to do is talk to you a little bit about uh, the nature of autism today and then tr at least my understanding of part of the nature of autism and then try to use that to describe how we can develop better interventions for younger children um, and we have some documentation of that and then use the same notions, the same sort of model of autism to talk about how we may be able to really have greater impact in the elementary and high school period uh, for children with autism. Most of what I'm gonna talk about today is in a chapter in this book, and I'm not putting this up here for you to buy the book. I think you can still look Go to the website for this book and download the chapter for free. So if you didn't get the chapter already, you can just pick it up from, from this uh, education, educational interventions for students with autism. Uh, so, you know, I want to talk about the current status and the future needs of um, research and practice for intervention for children with autism in schools. K through 12 is the longest period of systematic intervention opportunity for all children with autism that we have. Uh, it's the most equitable as well because people from varying socioeconomic strata can get basically the same, the same potential number of hours of intervention and yet we haven't really shifted gears from the preschool, which is very important, to bringing the science of autism to the classroom to really help teachers understand better how to work more effectively with these children. And we really need to, because it is singularly the most important period of time and most available opportunity for intervention for children with autism. In order to understand intervention, and I'm gonna show you how this is almost built into federal law, in order to understand how to do intervention, educational intervention, you really need to know the nature of the, of the problems that are inhibiting learning in the child. So we're gonna talk about the nature of problems that inhibit learning in children with autism today. Um, we've learned a lot about that, the nature of the problems that inhibit learning in autism from the study of younger children. Uh, and there's some, you know, it's kind of an interesting story, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that and then try to flip that over into describing how we can use that same understanding to better serve older children. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I think is interesting, you know, is that there's lots of children being served in schools, all under the rubric of exceptionalities or neurodevelopmental disorders, depending upon whether you're talking from the, the psychiatric, uh, um, lexicon or from IDEA. Uh, there's a variety of different types of problems that affect learning in children. I think you all know of them. Autism is one of those. Um, and to some degree, we're struggling with developing interventions for all children who have learning problems in schools. I, I don't think there's anyone that could stand up on this stage anywhere in the world and say we perfectly understand how to do intervention for children with reading disabilities or math disabilities or ADHD or any of the, the problems in learning that children have. That's important to understand when we think about what we want our schools to do. Our schools are nationwide dealing with about 13% of the entire population under the rubric of exceptionalities. And for each one of those groups of children, people are coming to them and saying, we want you to try this, we want you to try something else. So the schools um, are really in a situation where they have a lot of needs to fill, a lot of people are coming at them for individual groups of children and it's hard for them to manage any of those interventions. Um, and I say that because 
schools come under a lot of pressure to do the right thing. And I think it's interesting or important to understand why they have some, one of the reasons that they have difficulty meeting that, meeting the, the responsibility of having optimal interventions for all children. The other reason, though, is because we don't really understand the nature of the learning impairments that affect most children. So when we talk about IDEA, we talk about federal legislature, we actually, in science, borrow a lot of the structure of how we think about things from the legislature. So in the case of children with learning problems, we say that they have an impairment. Some people don't like that word, but that is the federal terminology, an impairment. And an impairment is described as a problem loss or problem of a psychological, physiological, anat anatomical function or structure. When they talk about anatomical, it usually means neurological. And it leads to the development of a problem in development, particularly learning as it's in, in, in different areas of learning in school-age children. We talk about a disability as the more specific expression of the impairment, right? So if we are talking about a child with phonemic processing disturbances early in kindergarten, first grade, we're more than likely talking about, that's the impairment, phonemic processing, we're more than likely talking about a child with a, a problem with word reading, at the word reading level. With autism, what would you say the impairment is? And then what do we say the expression is? Unless we can answer those two questions for schools, for teachers, it's going to be very hard for us to make progress in serving children with autism. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a shot at that today. I'm going to say that the problem for children with autism is that they have a very difficult time adopting the same point of view as someone else. And I'm going to say that that's in large part an attention problem, a social attention problem, and it leads to social learning disability. Social learning disability meaning difficulty in acquiring information from another person. Okay, so I'm going to elaborate on that now for a few minutes. But first, let's, it's important to understand where we've come from in the, in the history of research on autism. And I think that it, it's a little surprising at times. You know, we've really been talking about this disorder. It was described 60 odd years ago. Two different people described it almost simultaneously, one in Baltimore, one in Austria, basically talking about a disorder of social development that looked like it had a biological basis because it was so atypical for mother children. Uh, and it, in Canner's terminology, it looked like it affected the child's ability to have an, uh, a typical affective relationship with someone else. It wasn't officially a diagnosis in the United States until 1980. When I started to work at UCLA in 1981, they had just begun to settle into the use of the term autism instead of childhood schizophrenia, for example, or a few other terms that we use for autism. So 40 years, 60 years of discovery, we've only really been thinking about autism per se for about 30 years, big difference. In education, Autism wasn't really part of the rubric or the, the classification system that allowed schools to provide extra service to a child until 1990. So now we're talking about a 20-year period of time, whereas we've been working with reading disability and ADHD a little bit longer, but maybe not much longer than that. Autism's only been something that we've focused on in schools for 20 years, 22 years. One of the reasons, and, and we've really only had a good diagnostic system since 1994. Uh, I know people, there's a controversy about what leads to the, what has led to the number of increasing um, identification or increasing prevalence of autism in, in society. Clearly one of them is that we didn't really have a diagnostic system that was accurate until 1994. And then once that came about, it took at least a generation to train people in its use. Moreover, when we first took a stab at having a diagnostic system, 
In my opinion, we made a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, in 1980, we described autism singularly in terms of the social deficit as a pervasive lack of responsiveness to others. That's in fact where the larger rubric of pervasive developmental disorder comes from. Now a pervasive lack of uh, relatedness or responsiveness to others is such a broad brush that it almost defines no child whatsoever. Because any child with autism, if you really, if you know them, you can see that they're responsive. So it threw people off for a long time, a long time. Um, it, the way we got around that was to, I'll just give you one example. And, and Marion Sigmund, who died this year, a great woman in the study of autism, made maybe the pivotal observation here that, that led to the underpinning of a pervasive lack of responsiveness to others. Children with autism show attachment behaviors. Marion saw that because at UCLA there were two inpatient units where children would come on to the inpatient units and be separated from their caregivers for a period of weeks to even months. Some of the children were as young as five and they became inconsolable. They decompensate. They became disorganized when their care caregivers left. And the, the disorganization was specific to the caregiver coming and going. It took Marion, oh, I don't know, she probably made that observation in the early 80s. She didn't really publish the definitive statement on that until 1989. It got rejected several times from, from journals because people didn't believe that because they thought of autism as having being, you could uh, describe it as a pervasive lack of responsiveness to others. That turns out not to be true at all. It's not a pervasive disorder whatsoever. It's a very specific disorder. In fact, we probably shouldn't have it under a rubric that says pervasive developmental disorders. It's very confusing. Now, you know, quite a few years later, we have these different terms with completely different connotations. Autism spectrum disorders. Right there, the, con the connotation is we could never describe autism as one thing because autism expresses itself in a variable way across people. So you can't say it's a pervasive lack of responsiveness to others. That's way too narrow. That wouldn't apply to all children. And unfortunately, it didn't apply to many children. In addition, though, we talk about things like the broad autism phenotype. We no longer talk about autism as a clear disorder, but rather an accumulation of behaviors that are there in most of us, but when you put them all together at a certain level of intensity, then it becomes incapacitating for the child. Or incapacitating is too strong a word. Let's see, we, we tend to move in that direction. Could be incapacitating for some groups of children, but not all, okay? It wasn't until we really, in 1994, based on about 15 years of research, the way we described the social deficits of autism changed, and it changed profoundly. From a pervasive lack of responsiveness to others, we, we then had four, three or four clear, relatively clear, descriptors of the social problems of children with autism. The best is a failure to develop peer relations. And fail, failure is probably too strong a world, word, but difficulty in developing age-appropriate peer relations is a very good diagnostic for autism. However, it's not very good until the child's four or five or six, when peer relations really become an evident part of life for most children, right? So we had to have diagnostics that, that could be used earlier than that in order to make the early identification of autism. So we used a lot of infant studies research to understand the early nature of autism. And one of the first things that we understood were their imitation problems, right? And their symbolic play problems. But those weren't strong enough indicators, not that they weren't important aspects of autism, it's just measuring them weren't strong enough. Where we could really find traction in discriminating young children with autism from young children with other developmental disorders was in a lack of spontaneously seeking to share enjoyment with other people. 
And I'm going to really define that for you. I'm going to give you very clear examples of exactly what that means. But that lack of spontaneously sh seeking to share enjoyment with others is part and parcel of not adopting the same point of view with other people. And it starts out pretty early in life for these children. Where did that come from? Well, a um, couple places. Maybe the most prominent was uh, Jerome Bruner, who was working at Cambridge, in University of Cambridge and, and Harvard. And he was doing studies of education. How do, you, how do you develop the best curriculum for elementary school children? And he thought, well, if we can understand how infants learn with caregivers, maybe we can, we can pull the gist of that out and understand learning in some fundamental way and then translate that into curriculums for elementary school children. And what Bruner realized or recognized, along with a lot of other people, but for the sake of argument, it was, we're going to say it was Bruner. What Bruner realized was that infants start to really pick up information from other people as soon as they can coordinate their visual attention with their caregiver. And they can't coordinate their visual, visual attention with a caregiver until at the earliest four, five, six months of age. And it really gradually increases between four to nine to 12 months of age. Infants get better and better with practice at understanding that they can look where somebody else looks or they can make somebody else look at something that they're interested in. Bruner called that joint attention and he said that you really can't learn unless you can have joint attention with somebody else about some referent out there. You can't exchange information unless you're paying attention to the same thing. Having done that, a group of us at the University of Miami and, and other groups around, around the country began to try to develop measures of this. We developed a measure of these kinds of joint attention skills in Miami between 1978 and 1981 because we were working with children who had motor disturbance and cognitive disturbance. And they were between the ages of about 12 months and, and 48 months. And we couldn't test them anyway because they had had any, any of the existing ways because they had motor disturbance. They couldn't pick up blocks. They couldn't do anything. But we could look to see whether they used their eyes to follow other people's attention and whether they used their eyes to direct other people's attention. And this is really Jeff Seibert's work. He developed a whole system of assessment. So responding to joint attention is a very important behavior that really has a pretty early onset. By five months of age, cortical neural systems are organizing to support this type of behavior where an infant at five months and this child is probably 15 months can see that this person is pointing to the left and looking to the left and turn their head in that direction not only to the left or to the right but behind that's a very difficult spatial task at six months infants can do this a little by eight months, they can do it, but it, you know, it takes them about two seconds. You turn your head and the infant looks at you and then goes So it's effortful. It takes a while to do. By 18 months, less than a second. They just can follow very rapidly. And our, our, our neural systems build efficiency in this gaze following t type of um, facility and kids play with it later in life. I made you look. I mean, it's just a very big part of life for us, right? If you're driving down the street in a busy city and you're, you're, it's, it's a new city to you and you really don't want to take your eyes off the road, but there's 10 people on the sidewalk looking up and pointing, you're really going to have to inhibit not to look up. It becomes a very fundamental part of how we judge where important information is in the world. But not only do infants follow gaze, they start to use their gaze to indicate what's interesting to them. So this child is looking at Pluto, a Disney character, bouncing around on the table there. And that's a stranger, or that's actually uh, Jessica Hobson, 
um, and she's basically just sat down with this young child, and immediately the child shares attention with her, spontaneously indicates or shares their interest in something, and then comes back. And you can see this happen over and over again with children. This tendency to spontaneously share interest comes online at least by nine months of age. It's rare that you'd ever see a nine-month-old not do this, regardless of whether they had Down syndrome or some sort of developmental disorder. If they're at the same age equivalence of about nine months, they're going to do this fairly frequently. Children with autism do this far less. It, this is a cardinal early symptom of autism, a failure to sh spontaneously share experience with other people. And you can measure it quite reliably in young children. So why is all this important? Well, think about how um, we learn language. You know, language is, a, is you know, it's really fundamental to people, but also very mysterious in how we manage to develop the skills so rapidly in the first three years of life. No one sits down with their child and item by item, maybe some people do, but it's a rare parent that item by item teaches their child language. You don't go into the kitchen and say, today it's cutlery, fork, 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 fork. That's, you know, kids aren't going to enjoy that. That's not the way it works. Instead, Parents and children are involved in incidental learning situations most often. But in an incidental learning situation, it, t it takes two to tango. The parent here can label an object and present an opportunity to learn, but usually the environment is complex enough that there is the object, but a lot of potential um, other objects that aren't correct to look at and aren't correct to map the word onto. So how does the child deal with that? What, what happens is they start to use joint attention to self-organize their learning environment. This baby can look up at their dad and see the dad is looking down here, not, not very clearly in this rather poor picture, um, and then look in this general vicinity instead of this vicinity and have an increased likelihood of picking up the right label. Now that's a responding to joint attention example of self-organizing the social learning environment in a way that benefits the 18-month-old. But think what happens when a baby comes toddling up to you like this, showing you an object. Now, what do you do? Do you just turn away? No, you say, wow, that's a really nice laser pointer. Why don't you put that back? <laughs> and that really presents a very um, good opportunity for the child to learn the object because they don't have to figure out which object we're talking about. And they're also probably motivated. They're interested in the object. So that's a really great self-organizing facility. So initiating joint attention tends to be as powerful or more powerful in language learning than responding to joint attention. But responding to joint attention probably plays a, language, uh, a role in language learning more frequently for the baby than initiating joint attention. So all of this comes about because the baby is very active in establishing a common frame of reference with the caregivers. You know, caregivers would get very frustrated, and you, you parents of children with autism understand this very well, that if you're constantly having to really make an effort to direct your child's attention, it sort of decreases the flow of the interaction and decreases the number of the learning opportunities. But if you can rely on your baby to spontaneously organize the environment, you can be a little bit more rapid in the presentation of learning opportunities. You can present more learning opportunities, and the baby has a greater chance of learning more information. That's, that's really what we're talking about. I mean, that's it in a nutshell in terms of this fundamental impairment in joint attention development that characterizes ch children with autism. It significantly decreases their ability to learn from caregivers and others. And we, now we can intervene with it, and we can actually turn that around a bit. 
But it says something about the nature of the disorder, that that fundamental human tendency to adopt a common reference is a problem for children with autism, and we need to remember that when they get into school. So basically, you have to, this, ha this has to be practiced. Now, infants don't develop this overnight. They practice it, practice it, practice it. If you're not practicing it, that's tough. That's hard. It's hard to develop the neural substrate that makes this happen automatically. Remember that, that eight and nine month olds, it, it takes them a long time to look, unless they're practicing it a lot. It still takes them a long time to look when they're three or four. And that long time disrupts learning. You've got to be able to do it fast. So this has to become an executive function for children. They have to do it at a high frequency. So when we talk about the impairment in children with autism, we're not saying they can't do it at all. We're just saying that the frequency is so low that it doesn't help them learn as much as they would like to learn, probably. And it doesn't also stimulate the development of cortical systems that ultimately make this easier and easier and easier for the child to do. Um, the other important thing is, if I say apple to you, something interesting happened. Most of us paid attention, mental attention, to an image of an apple. We all engaged in joint attention to an internal mental image because I used a symbol, a word, apple. How do we learn to pay attention, common or shared attention, to an internal mental representation unless we've practiced it over and over again with external objects? This is Mike Tomasello's uh, contribution to the model of autism, that, that really you have to do this externally over and over and over and over until you can get to a place where you can do it with mental objects too. So joint attention actually has a big link to symbolic thinking, according to the model. There isn't quite enough data for me to say we absolutely know this is true, but every test so far has suggested that that bit of theory is supported by the, the small amount of data that's out there. And it makes a lot of um, intuitive sense as well. Interestingly, children with autism have a difficult time with symbolic development, right? They also have, a, and they have joint attention disturbance. The one study that's been done on that suggests that joint attention, individual variation in joint attention in children with autism predicts later individual variation in symbolic abilities in children with autism. There's only one study. We need to have more. It's interesting though, blind children are very, very slow at developing joint attention skills because they can't use the visual uh, a modality for it, and the visual modality is highly spatial. I mean, there's auditory is somewhat spatial, but visual is very spatial. We're very able to determine location in space by looking at gaze. That really disrupts, is disrupted in blind children. So is symbolic development, so is communication development. They go on to get past that and develop joint intention skills through shared haptic. Uh, touching things with other people. And uh, this is back in the 70s in San Francisco, a great scientist named Freiberg, Freiberg actually documented that. Um, but initially, they're delayed in a lot of language symbolic uh, uh, development because of lack of shared visual attention. So that's a, a brief synopsis of the early kind of research, and it led to this model. It said that social attention, joint attention impairment was probably developing by nine months in children with autism. Now from sibling uh, research, infant sibling research, we can see it by 12 to 15 months. And that that was creating a less or contributing to a less organized learning environment for the children. And then that was contributing to subsequent problems. And this is called the social orienting or social attention model of autism. It doesn't say that, uh, that joint attention is the cause of autism. It just says that autism is a, I mean, that joint attention is a symptom. 
but it's a symptom that then has a ramification that's a little bit of the etiology of the disorder. And so that's something we want to disrupt. We want to change that. We want to make sure that children with autism have the best opportunity to develop joint attention skills. Since autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder, since the mid-90s, we've been trying to understand the neural systems that are uh, common to joint attention across people. And there are now, th actually there's more than three, there's about six imaging studies, and they all pretty much say the same thing. They say that joint attention is a distributed process. It requires multiple brain areas to engage in joint attention. And it's a, the multiple brain areas are fairly far apart. There's a lot of frontal and parietal brain areas, ventral frontal as well. Um, and that there are differences between IJA and RJA. IJA is associated with more reward activation. You have to have sort of an, in, um, an internal reward mechanism that makes joint attention pleasurable. So for example, when you go to a audience event, sporting event, theater, do you enjoy making eye contact with the person next to you when you see something interesting? Why? Why, why do you enjoy that? I mean, the interesting thing is in front of you, you have to take your eyes away from the interesting thing to make eye contact, so you're depriving yourself of what you're interested in. Why, does looking, why do you look at your friend? There's a lot of cognitive reasons for that, but there's a lot of social reward reason for that too. And we're beginning to uncover some of the neural platform for that social reward. And I raise this because the idea is that children with autism aren't incapable of joint attention, they're just not as interested in doing it. It's not as rewarding for them. That's one of the big hypotheses about joint attention impairment in autism. Here's the first study of joint attention in uh, individuals with autism. That's an imaging study. And basically, um, and this is Elizabeth Redke, who used to be at Stanford and unfortunately now is all the way across the country at the University of Maryland. And basically what she finds is this medial frontal area, that's a very important area for self-referenced processing, paying attention to what you're doing. This parietal area, very, very important for paying attention to what other people are doing. And interestingly, right here, this is called the inferior frontal gyrus. Uh, this is on the right, uh, no, is that the right or the left? I can't see, no, that's the left. Here's the inferior frontal gyrus on the right side of the brain. And that's actually part on the left side of the brain of word processing, of word expression, of Broca's area. On this side of the brain, we're not so sure it's just very interesting that an area that looks like it might be related to language processing is differentiating kids with autism from other people in terms of joint attention. But really it's this frontal media area, medial frontal area and the, the parietal area that stand out each and every time. Almost whenever we look at a social cognitive battery with children with autism and we look at differences, it's this medial frontal area and parietal area. I'm just gonna say one, I wasn't planning on talking about that very much, but that's very interesting because the medial frontal area, most people would say is not singularly involved, but, but a primary contributor to, to monitoring yourself, to knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it. The parietal cortex is very important to monitoring what other people are doing, where they're doing it, where they're doing it in space. And the notion of joint attention that we've developed over time is that it really takes that combination of things to engage in joint attention. You have to be able to monitor and pay attention to what you're interested in. Remember that there's somebody else out there. Look at them, figure out what they're doing, and combine those bits of information. It's important also to understand that one of the things that comes up frequently in the literature, the, the sort of neurodevelopmental literature in autism, is that when something requires brain areas that are far apart to work together, there's a greater risk that it's gonna be problematic for people with autism. 
they have, there's, there's a, a trend in the literature to suggest that more distal distributed processing is related to skills that are problematic for children with autism. That's background. This is probably going to be more interesting for most people, certainly more interesting for me. If all of what I've said or any of what I've said is true, we would expect the joint attention to be an important intervention target with young children with autism. Connie Cassery, who, who, who she and I worked together at UCLA on developing the sort of joint attention model, is doing fantastic work on this at UCLA now. I mean, she is probably the leader in understanding the intervention implications of joint attention theory for children with autism. One of the prime types of studies that she's done, and she's re replicated this, is to take groups of children getting intensive uh, applied behavior analytic interventions, right? 30 hours, 40 hours a week, this is 30 hours a week for a year, and then split those children into two groups. One group that gets the ABA and the other group that gets a six week, two time a week booster on joint attention. And what Connie does is she has developed an intervention method that increases the likelihood that young children with autism will engage in initiating joint attention, spontaneously share their interest about objects with other people by looking and showing and pointing and things of that nature. It takes about six weeks to increase the frequency in many children. And what she finds is that the ABA plus joint attention booster group does much better with language development um, a year or more after intervention. And she's just published a study five years later, and this ABA plus joint attention booster group is doing better than the ABA group alone. And that, that makes sense because joint attention is a facility of mind that helps people learn. Whereas what we're doing in ABA is we're teaching children skills. We're actually trying to give them knowledge. What Connie's doing is also giving them a way of paying attention that helps them learn. It's not, they're not learning a particular thing like put a block in a cup or sit down. They're learning to pay attention in a way that helps them learn anything, respond to intervention. And she now has, I would say, I mean, I'd recommend you start looking at this literature if you're interested, at least 10 publications on this. So let's, let's now, just with that background, the notion that, that for a reason that we don't fully understand, children with autism, one of the characteristics is that they aren't as motivated or don't as easily um, adopt the same point of view as someone else. And a whole group of problems follow from that. And most important is that they're not exchanging information with other people as easily as other children. That's a little bit different theory than the ones that we're commonly used to. We're used to the theory of mind idea, where children with autism may not be able to understand intentionality in someone. Or the executive function, they can't organize and plan as well. Or the weak central coherence idea, the idea that people with autism get trapped by details and can't see the whole, and consequently they're pulling out the wrong information all the time. Well, we're finally beginning to study which of those kinds of things are the most important over time for children with autism. And this is a very important study that, that uh, Pelicano did just recently. And when she looked at younger children here, um, she found that many of them were showing uh, deficits in theory of mind. Uh, but most of them, or quite a few, were showing deficits in all three areas. But three years later, by second grade, I think it was, um, what she found was that the theory of mind deficit was the one that was there for most children, and these other kinds of deficits were no longer so important. Now, what's, there's a lot of things that are important about this, but one of the things that's important is that the cognitive expression of autism may change over time. 
So we have to do a lot of research to understand how autism changes. How is it expressed in an eight-year-old versus a six-year-old, a 12-year-old versus an eight-year-old, a 16-year-old versus a 12-year-old? Because if we understand anything, we know that the nervous system is changing, neurodevelopment is changing, and it would make sense that the expression of a neurodevelopmental disorder such as autism is changing too, with some things becoming more prominent, some things less prominent. Social cognition and joint attention are pretty well related. They, I think they're coming at the same thing. I don't know if everybody really understands the social cognitive disturbance of autism. It's not so much understanding what somebody else has in mind. It's a tendency to look at the world and see the world in terms of intentional actions. We have two studies that suggest that theory of mind tells us something important about how much service a child will need in school. Children in regular schools, there are some groups of children that receive most of their time in a regular classroom and some groups of children who receive part of the time in the regular classroom and part in special ed. Theory of mind helps us understand why some children are capable of spending most of the time in regular ed. It's theory of mind and IQ combined together can discriminate those two. When we go to children who need some help in regular ed and maybe more intensive help in some other special ed context, then we're really just talking about IQ. But at the, the where children are all in a regular school, theory of mind ends up being pretty important according to two studies right now. We need to understand that much better, much better. What allows a child to be in regular ed besides IQ? And it's not just IQ. One thing we also know is that the, there's, there's developmental change all the time such that we have, there's, since 1996 we've known that we are underestimating IQ in the preschool period and that if we just follow children we see more and more children having IQs above the cutoff for intellectual disabilities. And I, I purposely am showing you 1996 data here because this has been replicated over and over again. And now we understand that there are lots of children who are quite capable of making it in a variety of situations, a variety of contexts, both in the school years and afterwards. That, that, that's part of the changing picture of autism where, you know, 20, 30 years ago, people didn't think that regular education was a context in which we wanted to be and needed to be concerned about children with autism. That's rapidly changed now, and I'm going to show you a little bit more information on that. We also see symptom change. People, the, you know, people with autism continue to improve. Now, for me, that suggests that there is a huge window of opportunity because I don't think we're doing a lot for the children yet, that nothing's systematic. And the fact that there is plasticity, that they're changing, suggests that if we do figure out other things to do, that change can be accelerated. This is data from Marion Sigmund. She was perhaps the first to notice this. And this is true for children who are affected by intellectual disabilities as well as children above the range that we use for criteria for intellectual disabilities. These negatives mean symptoms are decreasing. So it happens for all children, or at least when we look at groups of children, we see an indicator that it's happening for many children. So let me just try to, uh, to, to give you a very concrete example of the, the central nature of this difficulty with being able to adopt uh, the same point of view or a common frame of reference. Um, <clears throat> so do you know who Tim Page is? So Tim Page was the classical uh, music editor for the Washington Post. And uh, a few years ago, he wrote Parallel Play for the New Yorker. I think he's made this into a book. And, and Tim believes, with good reason, that he was affected by autism as he was growing up. He now works at USC. Um, and he recounts a, a perfect example of the nature of autism as it plays out in the classroom, particularly for a bright individual. So Tim was going on a field trip um, somewhere, I think, fourth grade, third grade, or something like that. And the assignment was 
to write a report about the field trip. Um, his report was, well, we went to Boston, Massachusetts through the town of Warrenville, Connecticut on Route 44A. It was very pretty and there was a church that reminded me of pictures of Russia from our book that is published by Times Life. We arrived in Boston at 9.17. At 11, we went on a big tour of Boston on Gray Line 43, made by the Superior Bus Company, like School Bus 6, which goes down Hamilton Lodge Road, where Maria lives, and then on to Separatist Road, and then to South Eagleville before it comes to our school. We saw lots of good things, like the, the Boston Massacre site. The tour ended at 105. Before I knew it, uh, we were going home. We went through Warrenville again, but it was too dark to see much. A few days later, it was Easter, and we got a cuckoo clock. And, and so then Tim writes that the teacher, you know, wrote, see me, uh, and broke her pencil, because she was so upset. So, you know, this is just one anecdote. It doesn't describe all children, but it does personify the nature of not being able to or not tending to, and we should think of it that way as much as able to, not tending to adopt the same point of view, and how that can really interrupt learning in the classroom. Now, Tim got something out of this. He goes on to say he was particularly interested in whether or not they were going to go through an intersection that he knew existed but had never gone through, and when they did go through that intersection, he thought that was the best part of the trip. So that's hard. That's hard if you're a teacher trying to convey something. If there's a body of knowledge that, that is important for children to have, and they're tending to not easily focus on the things that other people think are important, that can make it difficult in the classroom. But there are other problems that go along with not being able to adopt a, the same point of view as well, and we're going to get to those in a second. So when we talk about the impairment in autism, one of them, a major one, is this, this loss or abnormality of the joint attention system, which does have a neurodevelopmental um, support system, not dedicated, but a support system, and then what happens is children have difficulty adopting a common frame of reference, regardless of IQ. So high IQ, low IQ, that, that's a fairly common component of autism. And the emphasis here is no longer on what people, what children think about, but what they pay attention to. So one of the things I'm trying to say is that the social cognitive model was very simple. Children with autism don't think about what other people's, can't imagine other people's thoughts, and therefore they have problems. Well, it's not just thinking about other people's thoughts, it's paying attention to what other people are attending to. That's really problematic in the classroom, or in any sort of social interaction and communication interaction. It's very important to be able to adopt the same framework. So now let's look at what we have in schools. Uh, I don't know if you all know about the um, autism monitoring uh, system that we have in the United States. We monitor autism, the prevalence of autism in second grade in a number of states nationwide. It's where these figures come from. The 1 in 88 figure came from the 2008 data from the Adam Network. If you're interested in following the prevalence changes in autism, go on Google, find the Adam Network, bookmark it, and check in with it periodically because they're constantly publishing new data. One of the most interesting things, though, is that um, the uh, estimates of IDD, or intellectual and developmental disabilities, was about 75% of children with autism in 1994. It's now down to 38% in 2012. So we've had a complete sea change that more children with autism are in the low average to average range of IQ than are children with IDD, or intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and you can see uh, that's just gone, you know, you can, you can see some of the progress in that direction. We don't know whether that's because of early intervention, different identification, we don't know what that is, but we do know that most children in secondary school are served in regular schools. 
That's a big, big difference than when I started uh, in 1981. Now we do see some differences. So when we look at this, what the CDC has done with regard to second graders, uh, and the sample here was, um, I don't know, 360,000 children or something like that. Their estimates suggest that there's 600,000 children with autism in American schools right now. But when we look at the Institute for Educational Sciences, when they actually look at students identified with autism, they report 336,000, and instead of 1.2%, only 0.7%. And the reason for that is that we are still better at identifying younger children than older children. If a child goes into school and they get much beyond second or third grade, there's a diminishing likelihood that they'll be identified as affected by autism. But what we're seeing is that probably within 10 years, this number will match this number, that there'll be 600,000, because we see many more children in the early grades than we see in high school at this point in time. One reason that it's so difficult to provide the services, of course, is that the states get far less than they're mandated for special education. This is California. One of the interesting things from the CDC data is that identification is related to the number of dollars states put into special education. I mean, that's not, that's not terribly surprising, but if states don't have enough money, they identify fewer children. And California is not at the top of the list, by the way, in terms of identification, because California has a huge, huge gap. That's one of the reasons. Just briefly on outcome for, for these children. Now again, um, you know, we've, it, it's been long enough that we've known that there's lots of both higher functioning and children affected by IDD out there. We can say that for the last 10 years, it's been at least 40% higher functioning, 50%. Um, this is data on five years after school. And one thing we see is that people with autism, young adults with autism, have the lowest rate of living independently of all the exceptionalities. Even though many of those youth and young adults are higher functioning people. We, we haven't had an impact over here. We've had an impact on the preschool period, but not here. And the same sort of thing can be seen in the hourly wage. Here's the hourly wage for all people, this is, um, these numbers are about, you know, 800 people per, per group here. This is a very large study. Uh, $7.60, $7.70. So I don't, I don't understand those data. The, uh, these data, as much as anything, have got me into trying to figure out what we need to do in school to change these kinds of outcomes because they, they really aren't where they should be particularly if we have a lot of children who are no longer affected by intellectual and developmental disabilities. Here's the state of the art in terms of research on how to work effectively with children with autism in the classroom. Um, Machalisek in 2008 tried to review all the studies she could find. She found uh, 45 studies, but only 118 children in all 45 studies. Um, and basically, there was no research on secondary school. It was all on elementary school children. Um, this study was done uh, subsequently, found 214 studies, had a, had a more generous um, criteria for acceptance, but they found basically the same thing, that there were very few children in any study and very few studies over, for children over age 12, and the same thing in Europe. Um, we just haven't developed a scientific literature to support um, evidence-based instructional interventions. We have a lot of evidence-based behavioral interventions available, very useful have to be there, but not a lot of evidence-based instruction to try to get at the learning problems that m many of these children may have. So what do teachers want? 
We have to think about what teachers want if we're going to be able to develop intervention, and I'm learning this. You know, schools want to be participants in the development of interventions for children. And what they want is really important. What teachers want to do with the children is very important. What teachers want to do, they've been telling me, but there's also data on this, is they want better instructional methods. How do we teach these children to read? How do we teach them better math skills? And most importantly, how do we teach them to write? Because those are the three areas that many children with autism struggle with. Reading comprehension after the third or fourth grade, math problem solving, particularly if it's word problem solving, and writing. They struggle in those areas and they struggle mightily. And then if they do go off to a vocational setting or a higher education setting that demands those, they continue to struggle. Teachers want to know how to address that. Teachers recognize the utility of behavioral interventions, but they don't feel like that's what they were trained to do. Now, these aren't special ed teachers, right? Because these are teachers in regular classrooms. Teachers in regular classrooms are dealing with many children with varying exceptionalities, ADHD, autism, reading disability. They want help in instruction. They, want also, they also want help in behavioral methods, but that's not what they see as their central uh, focus. And one of the conclusions that people are beginning to reach is because we keep giving teachers evidence-based behavioral interventions and saying this is the evidence-based intervention that we want you to use, teachers are saying, well, that's, that's not me. That's not what I do. I want instruction. So they don't implement the evidence-based interventions. So increasingly, a number of people are beginning to write papers saying, let's switch gears. Let's understand the learning disabilities of children with autism in schools and provide teachers with methods to address the learning problems, not in addition to the behavioral problems. You can't ignore behavioral problems, but you want to do this in addition to have a comprehensive approach. Um, and so again, we've got four out of five, 84% attend regular schools by the time they go into secondary school. So again, that's one of the things, you know, most secondary school teachers, you're not, the special ed opportunities are different. Um, and 33% take much of their classwork in regular classes. We can also see that there's a big, once, once we get into regular class placement, we can see that IQ, like theory of mind, tends to have a difference. So when we talk about 100, an average of 106 versus an average of 94 in terms of IQ, that makes a difference in how much time a child is spending in the regular classroom versus, um, in the regular classroom, 50% of the time versus about 70% of the time. We have to understand that. I'm going to present some data towards the end that, that says it's not just IQ. It's not, maybe IQ is not the most important thing. The other, just a few more things, uh, just little characteristics, is that in the last 10 years, we've begun to understand that many students with autism in school do not achieve commensurate with IQ. They show a... Um, lower achievement than we would expect based on IQ and, and to such an extent that we that people have begun to talk about learning disabilities in children with autism. And I'm not going to go over all this, but basically this is a hundred children. Um, uh, you know, they were they did fairly well in reading, um, but many of them were lower than IQ, their, their IQ by one standard deviation. So they were doing okay, but they were showing some problems in keeping up. Uh, this study was with much younger children. 60% had lower achievement. And this one, one of the first studies, 70% had lower achievement than expected for IQ. Ten years ago, this literature wasn't there. We weren't talking about the learning problems that children with autism might have in the schools. But now we are. We're also talking about things that can moderate learning like ADHD. 
So I've been saying that, that children with autism have an attention disturbance. What's the difference between the attention disturbance of a child with autism, say a child with autism with an IQ of 90, and a child with ADHD with an IQ of 90? We have no idea. We have no idea what the difference in the attention disturbance is of children with autism in the classroom and children with ADHD. What we know is when we have samples of children with autism and we ask parents to rate them on ADHD symptoms, many of the children will be rated very high. Does that mean they're affected by ADHD? Or does that mean that they have some sort of attention disturbance and the only measure we have is an ADHD measure? We do know that kids who are higher on the ADHD scales are, doing, are having a harder time in the classroom, much harder. So it's measuring something that's very, very important, that there's basically distractibility and a tendency to really slow down and, and pay attention to stimuli slowly, and that seems to be one of the differences. We do interventions. You know, one of the things that kick-started the intervention research for younger children with autism was the notion of plasticity that their brains were reorganizing or organizing in the preschool period. Autism was disrupting that organization, so if we could get in there early, we could stop the disruption, the pathological process of disruption, because brains were relatively open to environmental impact in the preschool period. And somehow we got into the notion that that was the sensitive period for autism, that that's when brains are plastic. But it's not the case. I mean, really, if you look at the ADHD literature, they're talking about, you know, 8 to 18 as being the primary period of intervention for ADHD because you've got the maximum plasticity at age 8 and then the frontal lobes begin to really get organized in this 8 to 18 period. Well, the same thing holds for kids with autism. We think it's, you know, a frontal problem. And so this 8 to 18 year period probably is just as important for uh, long-term outcome as the preschool period. You can't say one is more important than the other. And my guess is until we start to realize that this is as important as the preschool period, we won't have the types of outcomes that children are capable of by the time they become adults. Um, and this is not anything new. I mean, you know, Evelyn Crone, um, where'd she go? There she is. Evelyn Crone right here has been saying this for a long time. She talks about this high school period or pre-adolescent to adolescent period as an absolutely critical window of opportunity for interventions for neurodevelopmental disorders. Okay, so we're, let's talk specifically about interventions in school. One thing that's come out recently in the literature, coming out of Yale, but mostly out of the United Kingdom, is the notion that reading, what we need for reading comprehension, maps onto almost the cognitive problems of children with autism. So for example, when we talk about poor reading comprehension, difficulty visualizing causes, difficulty with planning, difficulty integrating information, difficulty following references. When we talk about the core deficits of autism, they're very similar. You know, this, this difficulty following references, the largest study of reading problems in children with autism found that if you help them understand pronouns, and how to follow the reference of pronouns, you can have a significant impact on their reading comprehension. There's one study like that, 20 children. One study on that in the entire literature, but it's a very powerful study. So the notion right now is that reading comprehension from fourth grade on could be a gateway skill for children with autism that teachers really understand, want to be effective in, and if we can help them understand how being effective in reading comprehension really addresses some of the problems that children with autism have, we think that that's going to be a good match, that teachers will be more likely to implement evidence-based reading interventions. Um, and there is more than that one study that I talked about, but 
that's O'Connor and Klein, is that study about cueing students to choose a referent from a target pronoun was the best among the three strategies in developing reading in the small reading literature that's out there. And this is reading comprehension now. Not word reading, because children with autism can be very, very good at word reading, but many of them don't put the words together and comprehend the words as well as they might. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand attention in elementary and high school children with autism, and we're trying to understand attention in an ecologically valid fashion. And so what we've been doing is using a virtual reality public speaking task where we have the children come in and they see a virtual world that has lots of students in it, and we ask them questions about themselves and we say, we'd like to, as best as you can, there's no, you don't have to do this you know, in any way, is just tell this, these students about yourself because as though you were meeting them for the first time. And we ask them questions like, um, where do you live and who's in your family and very simple questions and if the child needs to stay at that level we stay with very simple questions and if they can answer what your favorite movie is and if they can answer why questions we move on to that because we're dealing with 8 to 16 year olds at all different levels. We can basically we do this for six minutes um, and uh, we lo have lots of measures but we're going to look at the number of looks to these avatars that the child shows. And this just gives you an idea of what it looks like for a child in the situation. So they're looking around and they're talking and we're recording what they're talking and we get the word counts. You'll notice that some of these avatars seem to be fading a little bit. In one condition, we, we allow them to fade and then when the child looks at them, they come back and that acts as an external cue to make this a little bit more interesting for children. So you, you get the sense. They're talking and looking around and we get a count of which avatars the child looks at. In terms of the characteristics, I mean, we have the ASD sample has an IQ of 105. Uh, the typical sample is around 113. That's a difference. We use uh, a memory measure. They're different in memory. They're, they have uh, a big difference in math skills, but mostly because it's word problems. They're different in reading, but only the older children, the 12 to 16 year olds, the 8 to 11 year olds aren't different in reading because the measure in 8 to 11 year olds is more canted towards word reading and the 12 to 16 is more canted towards text reading. So we see the reading problem coming in later on um, and listening skills, are, they're, they're different on all these things, which makes it difficult. We've got to really look at all the covariance and do a lot of statistical things to make sure that we understand what's going on. And we do that. And here's what we found, that <clears throat> There's no difference in looking to the central character, and, and this repeats over here, it's, it's, it's balanced. I'm just showing you one half of the field that the children see. There's no difference in the frequency of looking to the central character and no difference in frequency in looking to the character that's most out of view most often, right? But there's a big difference to looking to the child behind, one to the right and two to the right, the same thing here and here and here. There's a big difference between the groups in that. So big that this successfully discriminates about 75% of 37 children with autism between 8 and 16 and 54 typical children. And we can really look and see whether IQ is accounting for this in memory. It's not. This is something that really looks like it's a characteristic of what's going on for kids with autism. If we look at ADHD in the sample, we see that ADHD actually pulls the frequency down in typical kids and kids with autism and pushes the frequency up in kids without autism. So that's, that's what I was talking about before. But this is really what I want to show you just to close, and we're wait, not over, but too late, is that attention, those, that attention measure, you know, if we make an average of those three, looking to those three avatars, is somewhat related to IQ, but it's really strongly related to memory, and it's really strongly related to reading, and somewhat related to math, and somewhat related to listening skills. If we then say, okay, well, let's make sure that IQ is not affecting these relationships, we see this. The memory and attention are really strongly linked, and the attention and reading remain strongly linked, but not so much to math and not so much to listening. 
And then if we control memory, and this is one of the more important things, the IQ relationship vanishes. And we're left with memory relating to attention and attention relating to reading above and beyond memory. So we're beginning to think that we can't describe this problem, that the nature of the problem in children with autism and learning in terms of attention, we're gonna to have to do it in terms of how attention and memory are interacting. And how attention and memory are interacting perhaps around maintaining the same point of view as other people. So that's, that's, that's where we are today. But we're gonna push forward with this because we think, based on preschool uh, literature, that if we can identify the learning problems of elementary and high school students with autism, we can develop interventions that are gonna improve outcomes long-term. Thanks very much. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.